G'day guys, welcome to COVID Convos where we have real conversations with real people about what wellbeing looks like in a pandemic. And today, obviously I'm here and I'm joined by Kesh. Unfortunately, Simon isn't with us, but I'm sure um, Kesh is ready to go and full of beans. How are you, Kesh? Well, I'm feeling uh, pretty, pretty good, despite the fact that Australia is just starting to take this seriously and stuff's starting to close down, which is pretty good. Um, but we'll keep talking about that. Yeah. What, what day of the lockdown is this for you, Grigsy? Uh, day number 10. So, yeah, feeling a little bit like uh, Tom Hanks on Castaway, um, probably midway through the movie right now. Um, but anyway, uh, time to introduce our guest for today. So uh, Jess is here to join us. And Jess, I'm going to hand over to you to introduce yourself and share what you'd like us to know about you. Okay, thanks so much, Grigsy and Kesh, for having me. And thank you to those of you who are watching the Convent Covos. Um, so, oh, what's important to know about me? Um, I, I'm really fascinated by the situation at the moment. Um, I find it both fascinating, I find it both um, terrifying as well, but I also have found it to be a real space, uh, an opportunity to hold space for possibilities and to recreate uh, futures, to look at systems, um, and also to spend some time with my pet sheep. And so probably the most important thing to know out of all of that is that I have 18 pet sheep. Um, they are orphaned lambs as I live on a farm. And I very much find uh, a huge portion of my well-being contributed to spending time in nature to spending time caring and looking after my pet sheep. Jess, that's something that's really blown me away. Uh, so many questions that, that could go from, um, from that. But um, other than looking after your pet sheep, because we can probably get back into that and I'm sure they'll come up again. But what else, what else do, you, do you normally, I guess, when life looks normal or when life looks normal, what, what else do you do with yourself? Uh, so I work for the Institute of Positive Education at Geelong Grammar and I am a wellbeing consultant there. My background is a primary teacher, um, so uh, 12 years experience with working with primary school students, also with secondary in terms of teaching French, um, but moved into the space of wellbeing just because I was inherently using some of those principles and practices with my students, with my parents, with the staff and the wider community. Um, but interestingly enough, I still found there was quite a lot of uh, stress, a lot of frustration that was happening within the education sector. Um, and I guess I wanted to be able to contribute in a meaningful way that would help support people, um, particularly with their well-being, because I felt that that was very much overlooked um, in the education system um, as I was moving through it in my early days as a graduate teacher. Um, so a chance um, meeting, I guess, uh, I my last year of teaching officially in the classroom uh, school there and um, started to connect with a parent there uh, we looked at wanting to introduce well-being um, and helping parents and teachers understand what they could do for their own well-being and for others' well-being. So we began this uh, network, uh, which was the Positive International Educators Network. And 350 people later um, are all helping to contribute to each other's well-being in and around Singapore. Um, and while I was in Singapore, I met Justin Robinson, the director at Geelong at the Institute for Positive Education. And I cheekily said to him, love what you do. If ever you've got an opening, let me know. And he said, well, matter of fact, and the rest is pretty much history. So. <laughs> yeah. Wow. What a story. It's, it's so funny. The small things in life that then lead to, to just, yeah, opportunities that you would never, ever imagine. And that sounds just like it was meant to be. Um, although having said that, you've obviously made things happen. Congratulations on some amazing achievements there. And um, I'm sure it's just the starting, uh, starting point, but uh, wow, that's, that's quite, an, uh, quite a story to have. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm fascinated to know um, 
how I guess uh, your work right now is being affected by the the COVID situation. Working in um, one of Australia's largest boarding schools, um, our principal Rebecca Cody, I think, has actually done an amazing job. Uh, with her response um, and her ability to respond to the situation. Um, because we have four different campuses and we are very interconnected, there's lots of people moving from campus to campus all of the time. Uh, we have parent events um, and then they obviously connect with each other. Um, and so Rebecca's first instance was the well-being uh, of people and that was really important to her. Um, and so the decision was made um, late two weeks ago uh, now to, rem uh, to, to ask students to move back into care, whether that was with their guardians, as all students have a guardian, um, or whether that was able to be home with their parents, and for us to move to an online learning platform. So the uh, staff um, all staff across all campuses have been working incredibly hard over the last week and a bit to, um, to be able to um, have the students to access the remote learning. Um, and as much as possible, I guess, we've been very mindful of wanting to keep things as normal as possible, um, which obviously sounds strange um, given the times and given the lockdown and the uncertainty. But for Rebecca, the, the transparency across the community um, and particularly for the students was really important um, in being able to initiate quite a large um, but very well coordinated response. I want to dig into that a little bit. Um, one of the, I guess, pieces of advice that gets repeated across the wellbeing space and in the ether is this um, call to maintain routine. Mm -hmm. right. um, however that might look for people yeah. and you, you know that priority or emphasis on maintaining normalcy I would love to find out how that looked how did you try to maintain any sense of normalcy or routine for the kids in a time of uncertainty and difficulty that's such a great question <laughs> Um, and one that I think for me sparks um, uh, whether it's a, a tension point, um, particularly with the work um, um, and understanding uh, that idea around homeostasis and rebalancing um, and trying to move back to normalcy. Uh, I think some of the some of the um, the the normalisation um, that we've introduced with the students is the continued timetables. So they've continued to have their classes um, as much as possible when they would normally have their classes. So that timetable has timetable has maintained. Um, they're still continuing to attend chapel. Uh, so all students would always attend a weekly chapel with the Reverend um, Chappie there and they're making sure that that happens uh, via a Zoom link, a uh, bit of a modified approach that we're all turning to at the moment. Um, and then for us in our community, we have our regular morning tea, um, which takes place. There is um, the precaution, I guess, of social distancing or as a few of um, my colleagues and friends are starting to refer to it as, as physical distancing with social connection maintained. Um, so we are still having uh, those types of rituals, I guess you call it. Um, but a lot of our meeting, a lot of our connection is now online. Um, and whilst we say normal, I think even from my own perspective of having, you know, Zoom meetings all day long today, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, you know, my brain's hurting, it's not normal, it's different. Um, and so I think there's definitely space for us to explore that further. Yeah, and, you know, build upon that. There are so many different factors, you know, right now, Jessica's in a bit of a rural area and, you know, we're gonna struggle with bandwidth and Wi-Fi and connection. Um, and what happens when that's constantly happening? There's always this sort of like, you know, somebody's dropping out of the chat and somebody's dropping back in and, um, 
it's it's definitely not the same. It, it takes a different type of emotional and mental energy um, that I think we forget sometimes. It's not as simple as that. Yeah. Hmm. I think um, it's interesting, Kesh, because I had a situation earlier today where um, I was tuning in for my third Zoom call and I thought, I just want to try something a little bit different. So instead of the face-to-face, -face, uh, I opted the phone in using my mobile device. Um, and as I called the number and dialed the code, I then got through and it said, uh, we're sorry, this number is experiencing uh, large rates of congestion. Um, you will not be able to call in at this time. And I was like, huh, okay. Uh, so what does this now mean for my meeting and my responsibilities and what I'm supposed to be doing? Uh, and, and so I think even those types of assumptions that we're making by saying our life has been disrupted, um, but as much as possible, let's maintain normalcy and we'll move everything online. I think it's already starting to show some, um, some of the boundaries that we may be going to face. Yeah, there's definitely cracks appearing um, at the scenes. I think there's a hidden question here that I haven't got to explore as much as I would like on this pod podcast, which is um, interdependence. Um, mm -hmm. And it's great to think, okay, so everything is going to move online. Um, but what does that mean for our infrastructure? Is our infrastructure even capable of that? Um, mm -hmm. We haven't asked that question. We're going to be exploring it in real time. Uh, and that's also what COVID has sort of brought out for all of us. Like, I'm constantly amazed by this, and I, I want to hear what you think about this. Um, the difference in responses to COVID. Like, there are some of us that take it seriously. Uh, we're well informed. We understand the consequences. We understand the need for a slow spread. But to have that understanding, you really need to understand interdependency. It's not about you getting sick. It's not about the personal impact. You have to realize your collective impact on the rest of the world to take that seriously. And so many people just do not. They're just treating it as, I was a flu, if I get sick, I'll be all right, um, and we'll power through it. And that's not the point. The point is, if you get sick and everybody else is sick at the same time, we're not gonna have the infrastructure and resources to save people. Um, and that's just a very different question than we've ever had to ask before in our very individualistic society. Mm -hmm. um. So many things come to mind, Kesh, particularly with recent conversations um, that I've had and experiences um, two weeks ago uh, before they talked about limiting the numbers of people gathering uh, in Australia. I was meant to go to the ballet and catch up with a friend that I used to work with in Singapore. And her and I, we don't catch up very often, but we always have these wonderful dinner dates. We go to the Japanese restaurant, we have as much sashimi as we possibly can. And then we go and we sit down and watch the ballet and it's beautiful. Um, but I, it started to dawn on me, um, I guess, my role in this interdependent um, system that is, you know, starting to be stretched and um, stressed to points that we've not seen before. And I caught myself thinking, well, if I do go down to this event, I'm in a close proximity. Um, yes, they're saying it's still running, but in two days time, they're preventing this type of gathering from taking place. Um, what's the impact of me doing this? Uh, what's the impact for me if I go and do this? What's the impact for my friend if I've already had people that I've been exposed to without realizing? Um, but also then what's the impact if I am exposed and I then come back into my family environment where I've had my father very unwell recently with a compromised immune system. What does that then look like if I come back and there's that flow on effect? Um, and then Dave and I, my partner had a very interesting conversation even last night. And he said with the infrastructure that's happening, if we don't start to realize uh, our role, our responsibility, um, an example such as he who is 36, his mum who is 65, if they both present at the hospital with the same uh, conditions um, and are both identified as positive, um, then he will take precedence over having a bed than uh, his mother. And he said, I don't know how I feel about that. Um, and so all of a sudden, I think people are starting to see the interconnection. And I think more and more, there's a big awareness piece that's happening about the interdependency. Um, because I think with the work I've been doing and the ways of thinking um, for me that have always been inherent is that well-being is everybody's responsibility. Everything is so interconnected and interdependent um, that 
I don't think we can afford to be so blasé um, that, you know, the, the tiny little action that we take isn't going to have a ripple um, effect outwards and onwards. And we don't know what those effects are going to be. But I think also the same is true of, um, you know, at the moment, I'm kind of highlighting the, the bad ripple that can happen because of the interdependency. But I think what we're starting to see now is a movement towards that heliotropic effect. You know, those people that are turning towards the sun and thinking about the different ways of reframing um, and, and using this opportunity, this disruption as a way to explore the good that can come about and the ways that we can explore um, the system in new ways that we haven't perhaps yet thought of. It's interesting that you brought up interdependence, Kesh, because I've, I've been thinking about that a bit since we, um, we were both on a chat the other day that, we, that wasn't part of our COVID convos, but we were talking about um, in Germany, there's apparently um, instances of corona parties where people, young people go out and, you know, because everything's cancelled, they go and organise their private parties. And even seeing um, spring break still going ahead in, in America and thousands of people on the beach and that sort of thing. It's, it seems to be that some young people, and I'm not trying to, trying to necessarily um, age shame here, but some young people haven't understood that interdependence. Um, and the fact that even, I guess they think maybe if I get sick, then I'll be okay. But not thinking about that, what you've just um, touched on, Jess, which is family members, friends, that sort of thing, um, and how, how that can be affected. Um, I, think, I think it's something that we all need to reflect on, um, you know, because, us, oh, geez, it'd be really, really tough to, um, to deal with the fact that, you know, maybe you'd passed on something to, to somebody else and, and that sort of thing. I think it's something that we're learning about day in, day out um, because of, of the the media reports that are coming back um and yeah i'm certainly being conscious now for my for the people that i live with how i whether i do need to go out indeed or whether i can stay home and and maybe avoid that social contact even if it's as simple as going to the shops um Kesh. i'm gonna present a little bit of a question here um that's just popped into my brain with young people like all of us have played in education spaces. So we're very aware of the developmental cycle of people, right? Is it that surprising that teenagers are not thinking ahead, that they're not using executive functioning to understand or reflect upon the incredible interdependencies of their actions and just want to get smashed? <laughs> like, is that such a surprising thing? And as educators, both of you, you know, is there a way we can hold them through this and help them to understand? Such an interesting one, Kesh. Um, I think there's there's this notion. Um, I don't like to think of myself as old. I, I sometimes refer to myself as wise when I'm with my students, um, but they're like, "Oh, Miss Taylor, you're so old now." Um, but I think there is that 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 cautionary aspect that we do have to be mindful of. That um, when we're saying young people, we are making generalizations. Um, and uh, I think I've seen with particularly with the students as they were um, packing up to to move off to their guardians for the remote learning there were some that were that had questions that were uncertain but seeking to find out and to build their awareness and I think awareness has to be um, a, a key element a key process that we need to keep keep talking about and um, and keep exploring because I think regardless of your age without that awareness um, I think you know you you can't change what you don't notice and so if you don't have that awareness inbuilt then um, we're expecting people to do things that we maybe have the awareness about but others don't and so I think that there's a nice um, educative piece around awareness what does it look like um, and helping people to build that capability yeah I, I want to maybe just elaborate on that because I am um, you know, I think there's something there we could make more explicit. Awareness of what exactly, you know? Mm. What, what awareness of what could help right now? Mm. I think um, for me, um, there's two concepts that come to mind and we've spoken about both of them um, throughout this conversation. And, and one is awareness of interdependency. Um, and then some of the work um, that I'm looking at, at doing and, and sort of my, 
research inquiry um, ha has led me on is actually exploring can our awareness of interdependency actually support um, our ability to respond. And so looking at actually turning responsibility, um, the word on its head and thinking about our ability to respond. And so I'd be curious to think about the different ways um, and perhaps just through questions um, and just posing questions, you know, how might one uh, be responsible at this time? What does it look like um, in this changing world? Um, and, and helping them to explore interdependency and responsibility and build their awareness there, I think could be really helpful. Yes, I'm just, just aware of um, time and not taking too much of your day here. Um, a, a final question from me uh, relates back to the sheep because we never got back to them. Yeah. And um, <laughs> if you don't mind, I'll just ask one more question about that. Um, of course. So what, what do you actually, you mentioned that it has a, has a great impact on your wellbeing. What, what sort of things do you do? With, and, and I guess, did you intentionally search out um, the sheep? Uh, like uh, there's so many questions, I'm just struggling to narrow it down into one or two there. But um, from a wellbeing perspective, how does it connect? <laughs> yeah. Um. So I think um, I think for me, uh, the experience with living on a farm, and and it's my partner David, his family's farm, and um, and he's here working here full time. Um, and of a winter time, I'll go around with him and check the sheep. And, um, there's often some orphan lambs whose mothers haven't taken them or if the mother's passed away. And so we then become their sole, um, sole carers, their sole parents. Um, and so, yes, we refer to ourselves as mum and dad, um, for these beautiful, uh, babies. Um, but I think for me, it's that appreciation, um, of, again, the interdependency, you know, like if, if, if we respect um, the land and if we're aware of things, then we're able to be able to support on a greater level. And so for us, if we're aware that, um, you know, there's that orphan sheep there, then we can bring that back. If we know how to care for it, then we can look after it. We can provide a nice safe space, um, you know, for this lamb so that it can grow um, and, and live a nice um, healthy life. And I think for me, just that care for someone else is something that, uh i probably i understood and i've always i guess thought of myself as a caring person um but having no dependent on you for their life to continue something that i take on with great pride you know i'll be quick because i know um that we're running out of time but one of our gorgeous sheep last year tweety um, she, uh, was two weeks old. She developed paralysis. Uh, her back legs weren't functioning and we managed to find a vet, uh, that was able to treat her. Um, and so she is now able to walk again and she's got the biggest, uh, personality and attitude that I have ever seen on a sheep. Um, I'm almost sad to say that she does behave like the typical only child. Uh, because she's very demanding. It always has to be her. Um, if she don't, if you don't get her, give her what she wants, she will put her little ease back and she'll start charging. Um, but she's got such a beautiful personality. And I think just sometimes looking in areas that we don't normally look to, uh, to connect and to be curious um, and to see what can come is what really nourishes me. And I get that with the sheep. You know, I'm so surprised at what they do, what their capacity is um and their little personalities i just never thought that sheep had personalities and they do and they're gorgeous so yeah <laughs> well i've learned something today and um and uh, to be honest it was more more so than the sheep it was fantastic to see the um the reaction like i was just watching you when you were when you were talking about your sheep and and how passionate you are about them and that for me was was a real pleasure so i'm glad that you can um you, you derive that sort of enjoyment from something in your life and it sounds like they'll they'll be able to um to keep you busy throughout the the yeah the the isolation or the the quarantine that you're going to be um under in the coming days yeah man Those i need to get myself some sheep bro <laughs> <laughs> yes i want to say what a pleasure it is um or it has been to, to have you thank you so much for joining us
It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this and um, yeah, look forward to seeing what people do um, as we continue to move forward, thinking about that interdependency and responsibility. Excellent. Well, thanks so much to everyone for joining us. And uh, as always, we're going to request that if you liked what you saw, you uh, share or like or do whatever people do on social media. I can't say I'm an absolute uh, genius on social media. So do whatever people do on social media if they like something. And uh, in the meantime, you stay healthy, world.